He had a kind of a princely quality about him. Physically, mentally, he had the temperament, he had the physique, he had the heart. He had brilliant speed, great stamina. The girths which are made by saddlers wouldn't fit him. They had special ones made to go under that big belly. It is said by experts that he was the perfect horse in measurement. You could look at Secretary and you knew that he was something special. In addition to being an extraordinarily uh, good runner, uh, there was a very imperious uh, look to him. It had a big flashing copper coat on him, and when the sun's rays hit him, it was a beautiful thing to see. It was the way God intended to, uh, to make a horse. You can't anticipate greatness. You can't really define it, I suppose. It's something that, that, that God, every once in a while, sticks in somebody. And, uh, and because it comes from God, um, the gift can't be ignored. And it can't be defeated. And the great athletes use it, even if they're not human. Despite the universal praise ultimately lavished on this horse in a million, his career began without fanfare on July 4th, 1972, as his trainer, Lucian Lauren, looked on from the owner's box. He made his debut as a two-year-old at Aqueduct, and unfortunately, he had some trouble leaving the starting gate and got banged around. The rider did a terrible job, had him been in trouble the whole way. I mean, he was, you know, never had a chance to run, and everybody saw it. On the outside, it's Quebec 6th, followed by Fleet and Royal 7th. Version is 8th, Jacques Coup on the inside 9th, Secretariat is 10th. Lucian got up and kicked the chair across the box, and he said, damn, that horse should never be beaten. And that's when I knew that Lucian thought we had a really good horse. Secretariat's chief problem in his life was he was handled by people. Had he been handled by someone other than flawed human beings, he would have been undefeated. After finishing fourth in his all-too-human debut, Secretariat won his next two races, the second under a new jockey, Ron Turcott. But it wasn't until the Sanford Stakes at Saratoga that the horse who would capture America's heart gave us a peek into the future. I was sitting behind two horses. I started to make my move because it was an opening. And when them two horses come back together, they just ricocheted off him. And it's just like nothing happened. He went on and won by himself. That was the beginning where he really impressed me. Ronnie Turcotte wins it aboard Secretariat, under the wire, the winner by three lengths. He separated himself uh, from the rest of the crop pretty effectively, especially his races at Saratoga that summer. By the time that he approached his third start, then it was happening. I mean, then there was a lot being said in this red horse that Lucian Lauren has, and uh, could be something special. You know, it could be. In the middle of the racetrack, Secretariat with a rush moving to the leaders. They come down to the top of the stretch. Sunny South has the lead by a neck. Here comes Secretariat on the outside, rushing to contention. When Secretariat made his move in the hopeful, it was unlike any move that I'd ever seen a two-year-old make. It was uh, the kind of a move that you just it takes your breath away, that you could hear the collective gasp from the entire Saratoga grandstand. It was just like, wow, did you see that? They straighten away in the stretch, and Secretariat takes the lead by two lengths. He circled the entire field in 22 and 1 for a quarter, going around the turn about eight wide. And you don't see any horse, let alone two year old, do that. Physically, he was mature beyond his years. He was clearly the dominant two year old in America. There was a sustained interest in Secretariat, and he was anticipated to. Uh, as a, a real triple crown potential horse uh, right along. For a two-year-old to become horse of the year, he can't just be a very good two-year-old. He has to break the mold. He has to do something really sensational and different. Secretary, it looks like a two-year-old who could turn into a super horse.
Beyond his explosive acceleration and lofty bearing, Secretariat exuded a human dimension that quickly gained him national fame. Secretariat just had a regal way of standing before he was going out to work out, and uh, he looked like he was in charge. He was beautifully balanced and had this rich red color and the interesting blaze, but the best thing about him was his eye. It was incredible. All of a sudden, he'd be looking at stands, he'd walk down slow down, finally come to a little halt, like he was saying hello to that pretty girl in the stands. Every time he heard a camera, he turned. He'd stop and turn. I saw a secretary once watch an airplane fly overhead. I'd never seen that before. He had that star quality about him, sort of like the movie stars arriving on the red carpet at the Academy Awards. He would look over, give you the perfunctory, it's me, good to see you, gotta go. Instead of a bit player uh, on the New York stage, he would have probably been an English stage actor doing Shakespeare. If he could have talked, he would have been a son of a bitch, because he was arrogant. He was the heavyweight champion of the world, is what he was, and he knew it. That marquee quality sparked investor interest throughout the racing world. In early 1973, breeding shares for Secretariat were sold for a record total of $6 million. Then, after winning his first two starts of the year, the unexpected happened in his Kentucky Derby tune-up and aqueduct. The day before the Wood Memorial, I worked him a, an eighth of a, a three-eighths of a mile, and I had to kick him to, to make him work, and I never had to do that. And I told the foreman, there's something the matter with this horse. I said, you better have him checked out. And this word never got back to Lucian Lawn. Ronnie said the horse was acting funny in the gate, and every time he pulled on the rein, he jerked his head back that he had never done that, and he couldn't understand it. 70 yards in the finish, it's Angolite in front, Sham on the outside. And here's the finish, Angolite holding on, winning it by a neck. It's a big upset, Secretariat finishing third in a photo. But I think Turcotte was paying too much attention to Sham because he thought Sham was the only horse that he had to beat in the race and uh, somehow he allowed Angle Light to get past him. When the horses hit the wire, Lucian Lauren knew he lost with Secretariat, couldn't understand it, and did not know that he had won the race with Angle Light. With the Kentucky Derby just two weeks away, serious questions arose about Turcotte's ability to guide Secretariat to victory in the first leg of the Triple Crown. I thought he misjudged the pace, you know, and he was too far behind. You know, he couldn't run any faster as he did at the end, but uh, it was too late. I said then, you know, I just don't think Ronnie is the caliber competitor that we need. Lucian then said, no, I really think uh, that he'll be all right. I'll talk to him. We had a conversation, and Ronnie made a very emotional pitch to me not to take him off the horse, that he, would, he knew he'd made mistakes, but let him ride. If many didn't share Lauren's confidence in the rider, others began to wonder about the horse. This was after he had been syndicated for $6 million, and people wondered, did these people waste their money? Was he this good? Was he not? Were we going to have another failure in the Triple Crown? Secretariat came to Kentucky with a huge number of detractors. All of a sudden, Lucian Lauren brings him into Louisville, and there's just all this uh, uh, controversy about uh, rumors that he might have hurt himself. Uh, in the Wood Memorial, and, and Jimmy the Greek at that time was going around telling people the week of the Derby that the horse was lame. This horse was such a great two-year-old. He was horse of the year as a two-year-old, and now he's coming in here with a chance to be maybe the greatest thing since Man of War. But you can't block out all these rumors, and, and you wonder what's going to happen here today. But for all the negative fallout from his poor showing in the Wood Memorial, Secretariat was a three to two favorite to win the biggest race of his young life. A record 134,000 hummed with expectations. This is Churchill Downs, Louisville, Kentucky on this first Saturday in May, 1973. I'm Jack Whitaker and this is the 99th running of the Kentucky Derby. Moments from a start. Secretariat is in the gate, Mike Gallant is moving in. Secretariat throws his head a bit. They're at the post, and they're off for the lead. On the inside, that's Angolite for the lead. He broke dead last, and he was dead last after a quarter of a mile. Then four goes. On the outside, Navajo, followed by Secretariat. Into the spring of his three-year-old year, Secretariat really started making up his own mind. He seemed to understand racing. 
and seemed to want to dictate his own strategy. Secretariat is fourth and moving up on the outside and is now third and moving at the leaders as they come for the head of the stretch. They're at the head of the stretch and Cham is the leader. He leads it by a length. Secretariat is in the center of the racetrack and driving. And then he made this tremendous move and we knew that we had seen something historic and maybe perhaps we were going to have a great triple crown winner. Now and there's the stretch. It's sec Secretariat. Secretariat on the outside to take the lead. Cham holding in second. It's Secretariat moving away. He has it by two and a half. And I read back and hit him a couple of times. And shoot, he just took off. I just put my stick down and he, he went by two and a half very easily. Cham, then on the outside, our native. That's the wire. It's going to be Secretariat. He wins it by two lengths. Secretariat just broke the old Kentucky Derby record. People were looking at the tote board. He ran the last quarter mile in 23 seconds, which is unprecedented in the Derby. Secretariat did something that no horse ever did. He went each of the five quarters faster. It just defied logic. Another quarter of a mile he might have taken to the air and flown, which is obviously what was in his blood. As the first horse to run the mile and a quarter Derby in under two minutes, Secretariat turned what had been uneasiness in Louisville into confidence in Baltimore. He went off as a 3-10 to 10 favorite in the Preakness, the Triple Crown's tightly turned second leg. Well, it's almost ready. The horse is just about to move into that starting gate. The weather is perfect, and we're just waiting for a fine horse race. Secretariat was still running with an explosive style, and centrifugal force would carry him wide on the turns, and Pimlico is considered to have tighter turns. That was the one I was worried about. And they're off. Oh, the early lead. That's Deadly Dream on the outside at Coley Taj. Then it's also Torsion on the outside. In the Preakness, he broke last again. Now he's going to the turn. You think it's going to be the same thing as the Derby. Then our native and Secretariat is last again as they move into the first turn. Turcotte took a hold of him, made it almost an imperceptible gesture with his hands, like a man adjusting his cuff. Took the horse to the outside and he went boom. He went from last to first in about 180 yards. Sham under an easy hole right now, but here comes Secretariat. He's moving fast and he's going to the outside. He's going for the lead and it's right now he's looking for it. He just accelerated and just circled the field and I said, good Lord, what is Turcotte thinking about? I mean, this horse is cooked because you just didn't see a horse ever make a move like that, especially in the first turn. It was far too early for him to have been moved strategically. Ronnie wouldn't have asked him to run that soon in the race. It had to be what the horse wanted to do. Secretariat holding it by a length and a half. Here comes Sham second on the outside now. Now it's Secretariat the leader by a length and a half with Sham moving into second. Once I get to the lead there and I just drop him on the rail and just turn his head loose and he went back to gallop from his old self. You know, he just loping alone. You know, I kept thinking Belmont. Secretariat by two lengths. Sham driving second. There's a strong left-handed whip again by Tinkai. He goes to it time and time again. But Ronnie Turcotte has his whip put away. And Secretariat has him put away. He's beginning to draw away. It is Secretariat. He's coming to the wire. He wins it by two and a half, almost three. He went into another level of, of consciousness in the uh, public eye. There were actually kids standing on the rail as he came by. This horse had now captured the public, not just a racing crowd. Secretariat did it again today. He won the Preakness at Pimlico, and he's now two-thirds of the way toward the Triple Crown. Expectations were very high for any horse, not just Secretariat, to win the Triple Crown. After 25 years since Citation had won it in 1948, there'd been a lot of very good horses that had tried to win and failed. Winning the Triple Crown seemed almost impossible. It uh, was tantamount to the 400 hitter in baseball or the DiMaggio 56 game hitting streak. This was something that uh, most Americans had finally concluded will never happen again. No one will ever win the Triple Crown again. Secretariat gave people uh, sort of a uh, scandal proof uh, celebrity to, uh, to to look at and to enjoy without the residue of messy politics. He was the only honest thing in the country at the time. This huge, magnificent animal that uh, wasn't tied up in scandal, wasn't tied up in money. He just ran because he loved running. Not since Man of War in 1920 had a horse so captivated a nation. 
Now the 1 to 10 favorite had a chance to succeed where seven horses failed since 1948 to win the Belmont Stakes after taking the first two legs of the Triple Crown. It was impossible for Citation to create the excitement that Secretariat did because television was in its infancy at the time, really. But Secretariat was on a national occupation because they'd all seen him in color on television. And he was really the first uh, equine hero of the media age. Uh, he'd been on the covers of Sports Illustrated, Time, Newsweek. We were all under a lot of pressure. You talk about attention. When you're on the cover of three national magazines, it was really hell week. Uh, it was, could I get through every day? And it was really terribly wearing. I wouldn't want to do it again. There was a lot of cameras and a lot of people, interviewers, writers and all that. And they kept sticking Mike in my face, you know, and asking me if I was nervous. And gee, if I wasn't nervous, then I wouldn't have been normal. We had a, an overwhelming request for uh, credentials. People that had never seen a, a horse race uh, that were in the newspaper business uh, uh, wanted to get up close and, and see this horse. It was really a frenzy of interest. June 9th, the day of reckoning, broke bright and clear. By post time, millions of Secretariat fans had put their money where their hearts were, some for the first time in their lives. Of the 70,000 that overflowed the stands, a few had been at the track since sunup. I was there at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was there all night. I fell asleep against a tree by his barn. The fittest I have ever seen a horse. His eyes were big as saucers. His nostrils were flared. He was nickering. His ears were playing. His muscles were rippling. And he's walking around on his hind legs. And I remember thinking to myself, boy, what are we going to see today? Before the race, you could see not only what Secretariat meant to really veteran, hard-boiled, you know, step over a guy with a heart attack so they don't get shut out at the window betters, okay? But also with people who were at that track who were not gamblers, who brought their kids because it was Secretariat. This was the people's horse. Everybody wanted to see him not only win, but do it in a way that would really be authoritative. I'm looking at him and I think, I've never seen him walk like this before. He looks like the execution man. He's going to the gallows. <laughs> He's about to dispatch somebody. And they're off. Looks like the early lead goes to Mike Gallon. Yes, Mike Gallon going for the lead with Dwight and Press on the outside. Secretary to away very well, has good position on the rail, and in fact is now going up with the leader. Sham had been such a tough competitor for him in the first two races. Uh, he wondered, would this finally be Sham's day? My instructions were uh, to, to, to be very close to Secretaria from the way go. And now it's Sham. Sham and Secretary are right together into the first turn. Mike Gallon has third behind them. Then it's twice the Prince, and the trailer is private smiles as they go by the turn. He just felt like running. That was the day he felt terrific. I said, just leave him alone. I said, just take a long hold and let him run his own race. Ron Turcott, he let him run. Come on, let's see what he's got. You've done the Derby, you've done the Preakness, come on. Let's see how he goes all out. How good can this guy go? They continue down the back stretch. Is that secretary not taking the lead? I looked at the teletimer and saw that the horse had gone three quarters of a mile in 109 and two, which is the fastest three quarters of a mile ever run in the Belmont Stakes. And he's leaving Sham at this point. They're moving on the turn now. For the turn at Secretariat. It looks like he's opening. The lead is increasing. He is running and running and running. And I turned to the guy next to me and I said, He's lost the horse. Three and a half. He's moving into the turn. Secretary and holding on to a large lead. Graham is second and then it's a long way back to my gallon and twice a quick. And I'm thinking, he has gone insane. And I'm saying, I'm cursing him under my breath. You moron. What are you doing? You know, you're going to kill the horse. You're going to lose the triple crown. Don't you know how fast you're going? Nobody knew that that was going to happen. Uh, not the rider, not the trainer, not the owner. I think probably not the horse. Secretary is widening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Secretary by 12. Secretary by 14 lengths on the turn. And he still has a quarter of a mile to go. And I'm thinking to myself, 
He's going to totally collapse in the stretch. He can't keep this up. And I'm asking, other guys are on the track, what are you thinking? And everybody to a man is thinking, he's going too damn fast. Secretary is in a position that seems impossible to get. He's into the stretch. Secretary leads his field by 18 lengths. Lucian said to me, oh my God, Ronnie, just don't fall off. Don't fall off. Finally, after I turned for home, my curiosity got the best of me. I had to turn around. When I look at it, I scare myself. I believed in Pegasus that day, because I saw him. I mean, I never saw anything like that in my life. 31 lengths. I mean, it's a, think of what that, I mean, that's unbelievable. It's like, it's like they were racing on two different racetracks. It was like the Lord was holding the reins. Secretary was one of his creatures, and he maybe whispered to him a, a go, and that horse really went. It was really an almost supernatural uh, experience. It really was. I leaped up out of my chair at Belmont Park, shouting, we'll never see this again. And I get to the elevator to go down to the winner's circle, and I'm standing next to Pete Axton. And he said, I used to think that the Ali Fraser fight in Madison Square Garden was the greatest thing I've ever seen. This was even greater. Everybody was speechless. And then, when it set in, people were crying. I actually saw people cry at this event. I mean, it was such an overwhelming thing. There were these co-eds lining the rail. And this sounds hard to believe, but I swear half of them were weeping as he went by. The day that Secretary won the Belmont, I went back to the barn with him, and I was standing outside, and there was oh, probably 30, 50 people there, and they were giving him the saliva test. And I remember a woman saying, they're treating him like just another horse. Jack Nicholas once called me over and said, you were at the Belmont, you saw that race. And I said, yes. And he said, I was all alone in my living room, watching. And as he came down the stretch, pulling away, I applauded and I cried. And Haywood said to him, in a, in a brilliant moment of epiphany and insight, he said, Jack, don't you understand? He said, all of your life, in your game, you've been striving for perfection. And he said, at the end of the Belmont, you saw it. Many people bought mutual tickets on Secretary in the Belmont, which they never cashed. That was to be their souvenir. Because when you are in the presence of something marvelous, some little bit of it, like a piece of glitter, drops on you, and you've got it, you, you've got that ticket. Part of Secretariat's glory is with you. You didn't care about the ticket. When you beat a track record, you normally beat it by a fifth of a second. He knocked two seconds, maybe two and a fifth, off of the track record and won by 31 lengths. It was, there, there's no horse in the history of horse racing that could have ever beaten Secretariat on that day. I mean, it was just so devastating. It was like the 29 foot jump, it was like Tiger Woods at Masters. His performance is right there with, with Will Chamberlain and Don Larson. You're not supposed to win majors by a dozen strokes. You're not supposed to score 100 points. And you're not supposed to win the Belmont by 31 lengths. The desperate way in which the losers were so beaten and so battered by this horse, it was the Confederate Army staggering home after Appomattox. I mean, these are all flowery, ridiculous things. And you could say, hey, it's nothing but a horse race. I'm sorry this horse was an athlete. around him and it was certainly the case with Secretariat this is more than a, than the story of a single horse or a, or or the story of the great American horse as athlete this is a story of one of the great American teams the team's leader was Penny Chenery Tweedy in 1971 with her father a victim of Alzheimer's disease Penny left her comfortable life in Denver and traveled to the East Coast with hopes of saving the family horse farm. We paid our bills, but we weren't earning 
a lot of money. My brother, the economist, said, uh, you know, I really don't think we can keep this up. Dad is no longer aware, and we ought to sell the horses and the farm and invest that money in the stock market. Coming to the wire, it's Reba Ridge under a hand ride by five lengths. Coming to the wire, it's Reba Ridge. Hope for Meadow Stable was sparked in 1972 when one of its horses, Reva Ridge, won the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont Stakes. Again, it was a great movie script to have Reva Ridge. Indeed, her farm manager, an old Mr. Gentry, said to me after 1972, well, I'm Sarah Haywood from Liz Tweedy. Next year, she, knocked me. she had all that excitement with Reva, and next year, she got nothing. And of course, nothing was Secretariat. Penny's greatest contribution to Secretariat was herself. Were it not for Penny Chenery, I think Secretariat would have been as famous and as popular a racehorse, but I don't think we would have remembered him in quite as completely a satisfying way. Penny was the perfect owner for Secretariat. Uh, she was this uh, uh, attractive, uh, intelligent, uh, gracious woman, and I think because of her probably, a lot of the women in America really became interested in secretary, maybe more than they would have been had there been uh, a man owner. I hope I've been a role model for women, but it just was never in italics in my uh, game plan. I just happened to be a woman. After taking control of Meadow Stable, Penny searched for a trainer she could believe in. Well, Lucian Lauren was about ready to retire when he was approached by Penny Chenery. She thought Roger Lauren, his son, would train, and he got another offer and left. And I said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, well, my dad's retired, but, you know, I think he'd help you out for a while. Lucian Lauren was very confident in his own abilities. He didn't allow uh, the media or anyone else to second guess him. And I think that that kind of confidence is very important. Otherwise, the grind of going through a Triple Crown could have caused a, a lesser trainer to self-destruct. Obviously, it worked out very well because he won five out of six consecutive Triple Crown races. Lauren's selection of Ron Turcott to ride Secretariat had its own special logic. Like the trainer, the jockey came from similar roots and hardships as a French Canadian. He grew up as a lumberjack working in the woods in Canada, and he was not the type of jockey to go out there and give out sound bites. He went out there and he rode his horses as hard as he could. I think uh, Ron was just perfect for that whole Secretariat team. Maybe a jockey that was more outgoing and that demanded the limelight more and all that might have kind of upset that chemistry a little bit. The thing that worked about Ronnie with Secretary is that Ronnie came to trust the horse. The rider couldn't do an awful lot to change him. And there was no particular need to. The biggest thing you can say about riding a super horse is he didn't screw it up. He fit the horse, the horse ran for him, uh, but this is a horse that would have run for just about anyone. In 1977, Lucien Lauren was inducted into the Horse Racing Hall of Fame. Ron Turcott was less fortunate. His riding career ended in 1978 when an accident on the track paralyzed him for life. It didn't bother him when he was paralyzed from that accident, and he, he just accepted it. And a lot of people would have said, why me? Ronnie took the attitude of why not me, and eventually went back into his life. Lucian Lauren and Ron Turcott were, would always, I think, be ranked at the top of their professions as trainers and jockeys, but being associated with Secretariat has really given them a special place. As a national icon, Secretariat was asked to run on an even faster track, the Celebrity Stakes. Freshly signed to a contract by the William Morris Agency, he shared the same talent stable with Sophia Loren and Elvis Presley. We saw the value of Secretariat, uh, who was quite a sex symbol, and, uh, but he was an incredible horse. Uh, we felt we could make a lot of deals for him. Caesar's Palace called, and they wanted Secretariat flown to Vegas and walked around the outdoor fountain three times a day. And for that, they were going to pay $75,000, $100,000. So we decided not to do that because it would be too much on the horse. There was some guy who wanted to market his manure in a plastic cube. I thought that was pretty off the wall. Despite the sweet smell of ancillary success generated by his fame, 
Secretariat continued to do what he did best. They had waited so long for a horse like this to come along, and he really filled their cup. He filled it to the brim. This is Secretariat Day in Chicago, Illinois. America's super horse, Tom Kirkhoff. On the outside, it's Secretariat. Secretariat in front by two. That's the 16th ball. One tick out of board, Secretariat. Secretariat in front. His first time over the turf course of winning one. Secretariat, the winner by four lengths. Three months after winning the Belmont, Secretariat ran in the Marlboro Cup against a horse he knew back in his early youth at Meadow Stable, the 1972 Derby winner, Reaver Ridge. With Reaver Ridge out in the middle of the track, moving up now to challenge. That's Reaver Ridge on the outside. And along the inside, there goes Onion now moving to contention. Onion on the rail, Reaver Ridge on the outside, those two heads apart. And I look and there comes that big red head with those checkered blinkers on him. And there was nothing he could do. I don't know if he knew it was a stable mate, but he knew that he, he got outrun for sure. He was totally out of it. And suddenly he kept from nowhere, he kept coming up faster and faster. And I was standing on the finish line with another member of the broadcast crew. And I said, he can't do it. And the other man said, he just did. On the outside, it's Secretariat. Secretariat in front by two. Reaver Ridge second and Cougar. Secretariat in front. What does Secretariat do? He runs by his stablemate, Reaver Ridge, sets a world record for a mile and an eighth. Secretariat ran his last race on a cold, wet October Sunday in Woodbine, Ontario. With Ron Turcott serving an unrelated suspension, season jockey Eddie Maple sat uneasy in the master horse's saddle. Maple was a nervous wreck, didn't want to... How would you like to be the, horse, the guy lost on horse in Secretariat's last race? You know, you wouldn't live that down for a while. If something happens and he doesn't win, well, they, they're just tar and feather me right there. And, and I told my wife, and, son goodbye you know maybe you'll never see him again everybody knew that this was the end that he was not going to race as a four-year-old and everybody wanted him to go out doing something spectacular and he did heading around the turn secretariat has the lead kennedy road is second vice lucky is third presidio is fourth. it is all secretariat and as the horses came out of the final turn you could see secretariat alone in front and Steam was blowing out of both nostrils with every exhale, like a locomotive. I mean, it was an incredible sight. And that was the, the final competitive moment of a, a career that uh, probably could have known no limits had he kept racing. He's in the stretch in a blaze of glory. Secretariat, ladies and gentlemen, it's all yours. Secretariat wins it by six. When the race was over, I went down and I reached down and grabbed uh, a handful of grass, which, as best as I could tell, was the last step that Secretariat had taken on the track. Like all great athletes who quit at the top, Secretariat left racing fans to wonder what might have been. We waited a long time for him. We waited since Man of War. I don't expect in my lifetime to see another one like him. Uh, we might see another affirmed or we might see another native dancer or something, but uh, he was perfect. Secretariat will parade in front of the grandstand for his final appearance on the track. It's very rare for people to come out to see a horse when he isn't actually racing, but Secretariat drew that kind of crowd. At Aqueduct on November 6, 1973, just 16 months since his inauspicious debut, 33,000 of the faithful gathered to watch the big chestnut canter past the stands on his last goodbye before retiring to stud. I can remember being there the day that, uh, that he arrived back at Bluegrass Field uh, in Lexington to be sent over to Claiborne Farms, and uh, it was almost like uh, Air Force One had landed and the president was getting off. He became such a an attraction, but also a, almost a cult hero. People loved to go to Claiborne to see him after he was retired. They couldn't really, really get over, this is secretary. We had people even lay down the stall. You know, uh, God, let me, let me lay on that straw if that's where secretaries sleep. When I moved here from California, I had never seen secretary before. And, you know, 
before I went out and looked for a place to live, before I went out and shopped for furniture, before I did anything, I just felt this uh, compelling need to go out to Claiborne Farm and, and see Secretariat. And in 1976, when the uh, Today Show, in, uh, in celebration of the Bicentennial, went to around to each state, I arranged for them to come to Claiborne Farm in Paris, and uh, we set up right uh, by the Secretariat paddock. And it was one of the great performances of all time because it was like he knew he was on national TV. He sat there and he posed with his head and his ears and it was like the star knew that the red light was on, it's time to perform. I asked Seth Hancock, now how could you tell? I mean, they all look so magnificent. How, how could you tell that Secretariat was any better than anyone else? He says, you know, it's their eyes. You know, the great athletes have great throwbreds. It's their eyes. And as he said eyes, Secretary snapped his head and stared at me like that to say, and you better believe it. Just look me right in the eyes. And, and he told me then, he said, even out in the field when they feed the horses, they wait till Secretary eats first. And Turcotte, standing up as high as he can, taking the applause of the crowd for his horse, Maybe the greatest horse anybody's ever seen. Secretariat's stud career began with high expectations, but he would never come close to passing on his greatness. He was not a failure at stud. He was a useful stallion, but he, you'd have to say that Secretariat was a bit of a disappointment. Secretariat was a terrific broodmare sire. Um, his daughters turned out to be very successful broodmares. But I think the expectations for him were so unrealistic that people were going to be disappointed no matter what he created. He produced some pretty good horses, General Assembly and Lady Secret, uh, who was the horse of the year in 1986. But I think people expected him to produce horses like him. And of course, that was just going to be impossible. In September of 1989, it was clear that something was wrong with Big Red. He let out one of the loudest, pitiful snickers that you've ever heard of any horse let out. He was just hurting. He was begging for help. There had been uh, stories that he was in some distress because of uh, laminitis. Laminitis is a truly devastating disease. The hoof walls start to separate. That's like you having a fingernail that's slowly being pu pulled off. And, and that's excruciatingly painful. And there's no way for the horse to get away from it um, because they have to stand on their feet. And uh, you hate to think of a horse like that being in any kind of pain. It was sad because uh, uh, he did mean so much to the sport. The horse who became so tremendously popular that he was once described as the people's horse has died. We all grieved in our way. None of us could bear to have Camelot fall. When I found out he died, I just broke down and wept uh, for a long time in my hotel room. We decided we'd bury him at 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning. You look at everybody's faces, and tears were rolling down the cheeks. And, you know, but that's that. You know, you bury him and uh, you be thankful for what you had. And, Go on back to your job and see if you can come close to getting your hands on another one like him, which will never happen, and you know it, but that's what you're in it for. When Secretariat died at 19, an autopsy revealed what every poet knew, that his heart was huge, some two and a half times larger than those who ran so far behind him. When I did the autopsy on Secretariat, we were quite astonished. He was certainly unusual. He was almost a, a freak in nature, but a freak in terms of being so abnormally perfect. He had a larger motor, and he was able to crack up oxygen and synthesize it faster and more efficiently than any other horse I've ever seen. He just had a superior power pack, and he was showing it to the world. I wonder what he thought. He must have had a sense of accomplishment. Every now and then, some athlete is touched for a moment with a kind of higher level of greatness, which they may never achieve again. But at that moment, they were more than life allows. It was the same thing that Babe Ruth did for baseball. There's someone that everyone can relate to, think about, be amazed about. And that's what he did for racing. <laughs> 